What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And as always, we have ourselves a jam-packed show, as we have quite a bit to get into, such as record-breaking numbers at certain NCAA Women's Volleyball matches being broken. Which matchup was the one that had that record broken in terms of most fans being there in a single match? And how about all the upsets that happened? Stanford knocking off number two, Nebraska. Are the Cardinals for real in terms of being true contenders outside the Pac-12? And how about Rice? They finally get that big breakout win, not only beating number 17, Creighton, but they also beat Kansas State as well. Is Rice going to be a team to watch for in the Conference USA? And Conference play does kick off this week as we have quite a bit to get into in terms of that. And we also have some high school volleyball to discuss, such as the Durango Falls Classic, and we got some FIVB to recap as well. So hand me a volleyball, set up the net, because I'm about to set up, serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. I hope you all are having a beautiful Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Monday, wherever you are listening from. Either way, you have made it to episode 160 of Set Point. And without any further delay, let's get on into that volleyball goodness. But first and foremost, iSports Radio is basically the reason why Set Point is on the air. Because without it, it wouldn't be live. You can IE Sports Radio on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok, at IE Sports Radio. You can also follow them on Facebook by typing in the word IE, then sports, then radio in the search bar. They also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com, and at the top, you will see a Patreon link, which starts at $5 a month. This will get you a shout from every one of our shows including this one. And higher tiers include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of IE Sports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on a segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Thank you, everyone, for all of your support and for making IE Sports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Big shout out to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Marcus Lowe's Great, Key to the Gate, and a donor that wishes to remain anonymous. Without any further delay, let's get started. So something I missed last week, and I totally am kicking myself for missing this, is I forgot to recap the FIVB Men's Volleyball Championship, which is my complete bad, everyone. I'm sorry. I got caught up in all the volleyball that I totally forgot about it. So where we left off was on September 5th, where Ukraine beat Netherlands... France outlasted Japan on September 5th in the round of 16. Then on September 6th in the round of 16, we had Argentina beating Serbia and Brazil beating Ireland. And then on September 7th in the quarterfinals, we had Italy outlasting France, which that was a complete barn burner right there. Right there, And we had Slovenia defeating Ukraine in four sets, which rounded off all the September 7th quarterfinals. Then on September 8th, we had Brazil defeating Argentina in four sets. And then we also had Poland, the reigning champion, taking down Brazil, or not Brazil, the U.S. in five sets. And I give credit to the U.S. for fighting, but unfortunately, they were down 0-2 in the match, and then they won the next two, and then they fell short in the fifth set, 15-12. So... Unfortunately, to all the U.S. fans, that's how the U.S.'s FIVB World Championships ended. It ended in finishing tied for fifth. But it's still a good battle that they had against Poland. I mean, it's Poland. They're, they're the reigning champions, and 
you can't go wrong with losing to them in what, in what was probably a very good quarterfinal matchup. The U.S. would have needed to play perfect in order for that for them to come out on top. Then the semifinals on September 10th, we had Poland outlasting Brazil in five sets as basically Poland lost the first set, won the second set, and then won the third set. Brazil won the fourth set, and then Poland outlasted Brazil in the fifth set. And then the other semifinal, Italy swept Slovenia, which basically set up the final being Italy versus Poland. First, we had the third place matchup as Brazil swept or Slo- Brazil beat Slovenia in four, won the first two sets by identical scores of 25-18, lost the, the third set 22-25, and then won the fourth set 25-18, funny enough. And in the final, oh my goodness, this was probably the most amazing final. Poland won the first set 25-22. Italy then started to catch fire, won the second set 25-21. They very much came alive in set 3, 25-18. And then in set 4, they just carried that momentum and won it in the fourth set 25-20, winning the FIVB Men's World Championship for the first time since... In 21 years, it's been that long since Italy has won the FIVB. So it was a long time coming. They dethroned the, I want to say it was the four-time and reigning national champion, Poland. So the fact that Italy was able to win was quite impressive. And I got to give a tip of the cap to them. I really, I don't know if I would have picked them to win, win the whole thing. I kind of was thinking maybe Brazil or France. But France, I think, was a little dinged up. So, unfortunately for them, they were unable to do so. But hats off to Italy, man. Like Italy is one of the top teams out there on the men's side of things. So, this is kind of not surprising, but I really am impressed. But, unfortunately, it was a tough loss for Poland, as they kind of got gentlemen swept right there. But it, it was still a great run for them, and they'll probably be back next year or whenever... There's like an FIVB championship or during the next tournament. So that is that for the FIVB men's side of things. I want to say the women start either it I it may be this week. It might be, but I think I for sure know there's going to be matches next week on the on the women's side. There will be there will be uh women's matches, but on. But I'm not sure if there is anything on the women's side this week. I will look that up. But overall, the FIVB Men's Volleyball Championship did not disappoint. I really think that it's going to be... It was it was something to watch for. And for those that did get to watch it in person, well, you got to probably see a spirited Poland crowd because Poland was the host site. So there will be FIVB Women's Volleyball World Championship matches this week. Starting on Friday, September 23rd, we have Poland versus Croatia, the Netherlands versus Kenya. Then on Saturday, we have Turkey versus Thailand, Belgium versus Puerto Rico, and Italy versus Cameroon. Then on Sunday, we have Belgium versus Kenya, China versus Argentina, and then Japan versus Colombia. Monday we will have – oh, that's it. Wait, what? Hello? <laughs> Do we not – is the U.S. not in this? I guess – oh, 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 I'm looking at Pool A. I'm looking at Pool A, which – why is this formatted like this? Thanks, Google. <laughs> I, 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 okay, now we got the full the full-on schedule if I'm – oh, no, we don't. We don't. Anyway, let's just go over the pools. So, I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. So, the pools consist of, in Pool A, Cameroon, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, Kenya, and Puerto Rico. Pool B consists of Poland, South Korea, Thailand, Dominican Republic, Turkey, and Croatia. Pool C consists of Bulgaria, Canada, forgive me for butchering this, Kazakh, Kazakhstan, the U.S., the United States, Germany, and Serbia. And then Pool D consists of Colombia, Czech Republic, Argentina, China, Japan, and Brazil. Pool D is the th- is the pool that I think is probably the most toughest of the 
of the four, just because Brazil, China, Japan, those are all pretty good, darn good teams. And if it is top 16 teams that make it into the whole knockout round, then I imagine those three teams will probably make it. If it's top eight, then it's probably going to be... That's probably going to be uh, just the top two teams from each pool. But either way, the men and the women do it quite differently, which I find a little weird, but it's all, it's all good. So pool composition, basically... Basically, the nationally seeded teams are the U.S., which is seeded number one nationally, which it does make sense, even though they had a bit of a slip up at the, what was it, the Pan Am Games or something along those lines. Either way, they didn't do well in one of their most recent tournaments. They got fourth. They got yeah. They didn't get fourth place. They got they lost the quarterfinals. And then Brazil is the number two nationally ranked seeded team. China is nationally ranked third. Then Turkey is fourth. Serbia fifth. Italy sixth. Dominican Republic seventh. Japan 9th, Germany 11th, and Belgium 13th, and then so on and so forth. The host teams are Netherlands and Poland. So Poland, just like the men's side of things, and as well as... Yeah, Poland is basically the host side of this whole thing. And the Netherlands, I'm not sure if Netherlands hosted on the men's side of things. I want to say they didn't, but if they did, then so be it. All I know is that Poland did host. So the first round of the matchups, I actually want to see the final standings. I actually want to see how the tournament, uh, how the uh, top teams basically like move on. I feel it's, I, I, I'm not entirely certain on this just because the men do it, men sometimes do it differently than the women do. But something you all need to make note of is that the host teams will automatically qualify for the knockout round. So basically, for example, let's say the U.S. finishes first and then Poland qualifies. Well, regardless of what happens, Poland and Netherlands are the co-hosts of the whole thing, of the whole FIVB. So if Netherlands is on the outside looking in, then they will jump the last ranked team. They'll jump the number eight team. But if Poland or Netherlands is in the t- the the required requisite to clinching a spot in the knockout round, then they will jump to the number one seed and then bump the current number one seed down. So take, for example, the U.S. finishes first, and then Poland makes it into the top 16, depending on where they're at. They would jump the U.S., and then the U.S. would be the number two seed. So that's kind of what happened in the previous women's tournament, which is why the U.S. kind of got dealt I wouldn't say kind of got dealt a bad hand. They lost to Serbia in the quarterfinals, which some people did not like the rule. I obviously understand the rule. At first, I didn't understand, but now I understand why the U.S. got bumped down to facing Serbia. But it's all good. So overall, basically, it is... The quarter, yeah, it's just the it goes quarterfinals, and it does not go top sixteen. So I imagine it's the top two teams in pool, just because that would be quite a number of teams taking it to the knockout round. So the top two teams in each pool make it to the quarterfinals, and then it all gets summarized up from there. I want to say the first place team from pool A plays the second place team from pool B, and then so on and so forth. Which the quarterfinals are on October 11th, and all quarterfinals are going to be on on that day. It's not going to be like two quarterfinals that on one day and then two quarterfinals on another day. It's not going to be like the men's side. So the women do things a whole lot differently, which I dig. I kind of – I like it. I like it. It's only eight teams, and then you basically – it's pool play. It's not like – you're facing everyone all over the place, and then you're basically in one big pot, which could determine where you're at in terms of standings. 
So basically, Pool A, I want to say Italy and Netherlands will probably come out on top. And then Pool B, I'm, I'm definitely taking Turkey, but it looks like Poland will probably come out on top. So now this means the margin of error in Pools A and B are going to be very minimal for both of these teams. For any of these teams in Pool A or Pool B. Just because even if Netherlands finishes on the outside looking in, they're still the host team, and I imagine they're going to qualify automatically. Unless, of course, they scrap that rule in the FIVB. But either way, I definitely am confident that it's it's Netherlands and Poland are basically automatically qualifying. So basically in Pool A, it's all about who finishes first, if not second, as I think Italy definitely has the best chance, and then Turkey I think has the best chance – of finishing right behind Poland and Netherlands, even though I'm pretty sure Turkey and or Italy will probably, I think they could win the pool A or pool B. And then once again, if Netherlands or Poland are on the outside looking in, they basically jump the second place team. Now pool C gets a little complicated. You've got the United States, Germany, Serbia, Bulgaria, Canada, and Kazakhstan. So obviously I'm, I'm I'm definitely thinking the U.S. is going to win Pool C. Now for the second place team, I pr- I'm thinking it's going to be Serbia. I think Serbia can actually, based on the last meeting between the U.S. and Serbia, I really think Serbia can finish second in Pool C. I am not, I'm not kidding you. I really think Serbia can actually win Pool C just because with how they surprised everyone, I really think with all that talent, they should be able to do so. And the U.S.-Serbia matchup is going to be quite interesting. I really think it's going to be an interesting matchup in Pool C. And then Pool D, I talked about how Pool D is really talented. Only two teams can advance, so I'll probably take Brazil. And it's I'm probably going to take Japan. I think Japan will get in. They were actually one of the hot teams in... The, in the previous tournament, not the FIV, the FIVB tournament, but in the Pan Am games, they were actually quite. They actually start off really strong, and then I don't know what happened to them. Maybe injuries might have derailed them, but they just fell apart, and then they eventually just they eventually couldn't. I don't think they missed the the uh, knockout round in the other tournament, but they eventually wound up tumbling down, and I think it eventually cost them just because all the losses started accumulating and honestly you can't afford too many losses in pool play so those are my predictions i'm probably going to be wrong knowing my luck it's probably going to be kenya knowing my luck it's probably going to be kenya thailand germany instead of serbia and china over japan when it comes to the pools, but I'm confident in my picks. I'm confident that's going to be Netherlands, Italy, Poland, Turkey, the U.S. and Serbia, and Brazil and Japan. I really think Pool D is probably the one that is probably going to have the most question marks in terms of its second place team. But those are my picks for the FIVB Women's Volleyball Championship. Let's jump on over to some AVP action just because this week is actually, I wouldn't say it's the season finale, but it's the big shebang. That's basically what I'm going to, what I'm going to call it. It's basically the granddaddy of them all. It's the, this one is for all the marbles. But first, actually, before I get into that, one of the AVP's tournaments did get can well, not like canceled. It got postponed, which basically is the nicer way of saying canceled. So, unfortunately, one of the AVP tournaments, not this week's tournament, absolutely not this week's tournament, but another tournament that was recently going to be played after the Gold Series tournament, unfortunately, has been postponed to next year. And it made me sad, as the Clearwater Open, which was scheduled for November 19th and 20th, has been postponed to early 2023, which, it makes me sad, (laughs) because now there's only two more tournaments following that, as they've got one in the Tour Series, and then the other in the Pro Series. But this week, it's all about the Phoenix Championships. The Phoenix Championships is the 
big one, the granddaddy of them all, the kitten caboodle, the big enchilada, the big chungus. This is basically for all the marbles right here. And I'm super excited for this tournament, and it's going to be a barn burner. So in case you all... So in case you all missed it, the main draw for the... It's only six teams. It's a six-team bracket. The top seed is Trevor Crab and Triborn. And then the second seed is James Shulk and Theo Brunner. The three seed is Taylor Sander and Taylor Crab, while the four seed is Paul Lottman and Miles Partain. Fifth seed, playing Lottman and Partain, is Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson. And then the sixth seed is Troy Field and Chase Budinger. Yes, the Chase Budinger, that is the former NBA player. So for this little tournament, it's bas- there's basically no consolation bracket. Basically, you have to win your way. Be- if you lose anywhere along the way, then it's basically bye-bye tournament for you. So Triborn and Trevor Crab have the bye, as well as Schalk and Brunner. But they... But- as for the pairs that I just mentioned earlier, those basically face off against one another on Friday. It's actually going to be an 8 p.m. start time. This is an interesting start time. I'm not sure if it's because of the Phoenix time and maybe it's one hour ahead of Pacific time and it uses Mountain Standard time. But it's quite interesting that they have an 8 p.m. start time. So for Lotman and for Partain, I really think that they're going to have quite the challenge against Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson. Those two are basically inseparable when it comes to when it comes to beach volleyball pairs. I really think that it's going to be quite the first quarterfinal between Miles Lotman and Paul, Paul Lotman and Miles Partain. Basically, it's a veteran and a rookie taking on two highly touted veterans. And then Taylor Sander, Taylor Crab, both those two are highly touted as well. They take take on Troy Field and Chase Budinger. Now those two, I'm not going to say that Taylor Sander and Tre- Taylor Crab are going to mow down the competition. I feel Troy Field and Chase Budinger can make it a battle, but it's like it's going to be tough for them. And then on Saturday, since everyone is guaranteed. I think everyone is guaranteed at least two matches. There is a sixth, a fifth place matchup, which basically the losers of Friday's quarterfinals basically face off on Saturday at 3.30 p.m. And then the semifinals are slated for 12.15 p.m. and then 1.15 p.m. I want to say, if it is Mountain Standard Time, then it's basically one hour ahead. But if it's not Mountain Standard Time, then basically it's... Pacific time. It's basically Pacific time. Might as well look up the world clock and see. Yeah, Phoenix is basically Pacific Standard Time. So basically, the first quarterfinal is at 8 p.m. And then the second one's at 9 p.m. So that's interesting. I'm quite baffled on why the late start time. But maybe it's different in Phoenix. I don't know. (laughs) I'm not the AVP creator. And then the 12-15 quarter semifinal and then the 115 semifinal is on Saturday and then it'll be followed up with a with the fifth place matchup at 3:30 p.m. then the third place matchup will be at 5:45 I I presume it's going to approximately follow that matchup with the exception of getting like a 1 hour grace period to like catch everyone's breath. And then the championship match is slated for Saturday at 8 p.m., which is basically going to be the big shebang. It's basically winner takes all. Now, here's the thing. I tell tell you all that I am bad at predicting. I'm horrible at predicting. I'm probably not going to make it probably not going to get this correct, but you know what? I'm going to make a prediction just for funsies. I'm going to predict that I'm going to pick the winner. I'm going to make my prediction of picking the winner. I'm going to pick Taylor Sander and Taylor Crab. I probably am going to regret it, but this is this is I feel it's basically anything can happen at this point. And I think Taylor Sander and Taylor Crab will be able to pull out all the wins. I'm not trying to discourage all the others. I really think James Shulk and Theo Brunner will be will 
you know, give them a battle. But I think Team Taylor or Taylor Sander, Taylor Crab can make it all the way. And then, I mean, look at what they did in the previous tournament. Well, no, not not them. Uh, they they made it all the way to the final, even though that they needed to win the tournament to guarantee them a spot in the final. They fell just short, but then they were able to become a wild card team. And look at where they're at. They're the three seed. And then as for the fi- the other finalists, I think Triborn and Trevor Crab are going to make it all the way to the final. I would not be surprised if they lost to Phil Dalhauser in Casey Patterson. Dalhauser and Patterson are my dark horse or is my dark horse to win the Phoenix Championship. That's my dark horse. My predicted final will be Taylor Crab versus Taylor Crab and Taylor Sander taking on Trevor Crab and Triborn. And then my predicted winner will be Taylor Team Taylor, Taylor Sander, Taylor Crab. And then my dark horse pick is basically Phil Dalhauser and Casey Patterson. So as for the women's side of things, as I mentioned just like the men's side of things, it's basically a six. It's a six pair bracket. Number one seed is Kelly Kalinske and Sarah Hughes. Number two seed is Sarah Sponsel and Therese Cannon. Number three seed is Betsy Flint and Kelly Chang. Four seed is Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss. Five seed is Julia Scholes and Gina Yarongo. And six seed is Sarah Pavin and Zana Muno. As just like the men's bracket. Three versus six on in the second quarterfinal, and then four versus five in the first quarterfinal. The women's gets the earlier start time as they get the six p.m. start time, followed by the seven p.m. start time with the second quarterfinal. And then Saturday there is the first semifinal at ten a.m., and then the other semifinal falls up at eleven a.m. And then the fifth place matchup will be at two thirty p.m., and then the third place matchup will be at 4.45 p.m., and the final is slated for 7 p.m., where a champion will be crowned. So, the women's draw, I really think, is so wide open. You look at all these pairs. You look at what Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss did. They had to win the Chicago Open to advance to qualify automatically. They did that. My thing is, can they beat an experienced Julia Scholes and Gina Yurongo team? And those two are basically underdogs, and they're basically doing they're ba- they know that they're a dark horse to win this whole thing, and they're not letting that define them. I think that can go either way. And then Betsy Flint and Kelly Cheng takes on Sarah Pavin and Zana Muno. This one is also a little bit this one is also up in the air. I really think that Flint and Cheng or Clace because Kelly, Cl- that was Kelly Clace's maiden name before she got married. So Cheng and Flint, I think they definitely have a lot of upside. Especially, but against Mon Muno and Pavin, that could go either way. I really think that either one of those matches could could flip flop. I I would not be surprised if we saw an upset with with six defeating three or five defeating four. But overall. My predicted final will be Kelly Kalinske and Sarah Hughes. And, oh, heck, let's go with K- Betsy Flint and Kelly Chang. Let's go one versus three for the final anyway. And then my predicted winner will be Sarah Hughes and Kelly Kalinske. I really think that they they have what it takes. And I think this is Sarah Hughes' time to shine. I think this is the chance to see her emerge as a household name. She was definitely a household name beforehand. It's just that she just had rough luck with so many partners being shuffled around due to injuries and due to them due to them calling it quits. So Sarah I think Sarah Hughes and Kelly Kalinsky break through as the champion. And then my dark horse pick would probably be Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, aka Team Tiger as our Louisiana host calls them. I would not be surprised if those two made it to the final. Just because they have... They're they're young, but they're so talented. They've only been out of college for... This will be year number two. And they have been taking the AVP and some of these tournaments by storm. And I would not be surprised to see them advancing to the semifinals. On paper, they look good. But can they get past... The talented Gina Yarongo, who is a veteran when it comes to the AVP, and Julia Scholes, who 
just came off of winning the FISU championship with Haley Harward. That is basically going to be the million dollar question. So that's basically it for the AVP. I it's hard to believe that the Gold Series is winding down very fast. After this, we're only going to have two tournaments. The Huntington Beach Open, which I'm hoping I can be at that just because it's in Huntington. It's near where I live, first of all. And then second of all, it might be the best chance for me to catch an AVP tournament. Otherwise, I'm going to be making 100,000 excuses on why I didn't go to it. And then we have the Central Florida Open. And then that's the last of the AVP tournaments until next calendar year. Hard to believe that the AVP has flown by just like that. It feels like yesterday. I'm going to try to see most of these AVP matches. I might have a game to be at on on Saturday. I'm not entirely certain, but it still remains to be seen. Like, we'll see what happens going forward. Like, maybe I could try to bring my laptop to watch the AVP and then do clip and then see clips on my phone as well. I might be going to the UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara matchup in Irvine, but it all remains to be seen. So that is that for the AVP portion of the show. Let's go on over to some high school girls volleyball because that actually was, there was actually a big time tournament that happened. So the Durango Fall Classic is a tournament that happens every single girls volleyball season. It's just girls volleyball and some of the best teams from all over the country come come down to Las Vegas, Nevada, and they partake in this little tournament. I want to say it's like 64 teams in this tournament, but either way, the winner of the tournament was none other than Cathedral Catholic of San Diego, who, man, I want to say they didn't even lose a set. Let me just tell you how good Cathedral Catholic is. One of their players was a part of the U.S. Youth National Team, and then I think they've got a few other players that have committed to... To college, I haven't really seen them in person. I don't think I've seen them in person at all. But I just know that Cathedral Catholic is the real deal. They're probably one of the best schools in San Diego. And honestly, I would not be surprised if they just ran the table. Now, do I think they're invincible? Probably not. But I did know they did play in a local tournament that I was at as they played in the Dave Moe's tournament in Orange County. They won that one and they didn't drop a set in that one, but they didn't really face the nationally ranked competition. They did get to face Marymount in the final, which was the last year's national champion. Now this year, Marymount kind of got hit hard in graduation and they're just kind of rebuilding to try to, you know, pick up the pieces just because for them, it, it, it's tough losing all their players, which included Elia Rubin, who is now killing it at Stanford. So looking at Cathedral Catholic, they swept pool play. They didn't drop a set in pool play. They won their qualifying round against Archbishop Mitty, which is one of the top teams in Northern California. And yeah, they didn't drop a set the rest of the way. They swept Punahou. This is best two out of three, by the way. They swept Punaho in the first round of the gold bracket. They swept Ayalani in the second in the yeah, in the quarterfinals of the gold bracket, they swept Punaho. In the semifinals, they swept Ayalani, and then the final they swept Marymount. Okay, this is best two out of three. It's much more different than three out of five, where if you lose the first set, you basically are scrambling. The third set format is so different in Durango. Normally the third set would go up to fifteen, you must win by two. If a third set is needed in the Durango tournament, it goes to 25 regardless. Now, I'm a little on the fence about this, but it's Durango. I'm not going to argue with it, and it's one of the top tournaments in the nation. You have to be on your A game, because if you're not, you don't deserve to be in this tournament. So overall, it was just another dominating performance from Cathedral Catholic. They basically dominated the tournament. I will give props to Marymount, though. They really impressed me. To get to the final is no easy feat, and they still have some talent on their team. It's just going to take them some time to, you know, pick up the pieces. And some of the na other nationally ranked teams in California didn't really participate, like Miracosta. That was a team I was surprised to not 
Nazi participate. Um, Palos Verdes, even though I, they didn't really do well in the previous tournament, Dave Mose, they didn't participate. Modern Day got ninth, which I was surprised to see them losing in the first round. But that Punahou matchup is a little tough just because they don't know what to expect from Punahou. But I digress. Sierra Canyon also impressed me as well, just because I thought they they did a good job, honestly. They got fifth in this tournament, or they tied for fifth, just because they don't have a true fifth place match. And I guess they kind of agreed on playing the fifth set match up to 15, which is totally understandable. Maybe, oh, they actually did place get fifth place outright, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the third place matchup between Ayalani and Fayetteville. But overall, Durango never did not disappoint, and I really – the southern section in terms of California is going to be very interesting. It's so wide open. Like like I said, Miracosta, you still have yet to see what they can do. Sierra Canyon is probably one of the top teams, but – and they even beat Marymount in their league just because Sierra Canyon – for those that don't know, they played in the Gold Coast League the past few years. Then they kind of got too big for their britches, so they got bumped up to the Mission League or Sunshine League. But I think it's just Mission League for the Upper League and then Sunshine League for the Lower League. But I digress on that. So Sierra Canyon got bumped up to the Mission League. They beat Marymount in a league game, which actually matters. They're actually one of the top teams. And this is the Sierra Canyon team. Yes, the same Sierra Canyon School that is host that basically has LeBron James's kids in it. This is the same Sierra Canyon team that actually won in the lower divisions. I think they won in Division Five and then Division Four and then Division Three. They eventually got brought up to the highest division, Division One and Two. Now this is going to be another topic for another day, but the CIF Southern Section Division One bracket is basically going to have pool play in it. But that's for a little bit later. The southern section, back to it, is very much wide open. Like I said, Miracosta, Sierra Canyon's up there. Redondo Union has a good team. Palos Verdes, I think, is capable of contending. Modern Day always has been good. They're, they've made it to the final the past nine straight years. Yes, they've made it to the CIF Southern Section Girls Volleyball Championship nine years in a row. Well, nine years, excluding the 2020 season, which had no season just because of COVID-19, but you get what I mean. The past nine full seasons of high school CIF Southern Section Girls Volleyball, we have seen that team get to the final. And then other teams that are good are Huntington Beach, which is in my neck of the woods. Do I think they're, they could contend with some of these teams? Absolutely. They're going to – I don't know if they'll get the greatest challenge in league just because they swept their first league opponent and then they play two more this week. I will be keeping my eyes on them though. I definitely am keeping on the my eyes on Craig Pizzanti and his team just because A, Craig Pizzanti was a former guest and B, he's in the same league that I cover or they're in the same league that I cover in terms of a team that I cover. But you know what I mean. Lakewood is another team that I think can contend in Division One in terms of the CIF Southern Section. I feel I'm missing a few teams, but overall, the CIF Southern Section Division One championship is up for grabs. It really is, my dudes. I really think that they're going to be... It's not going to be the easiest championship that anyone could win in. So... Yeah, near coast of Sierra Canyon. Marymount's definitely good, even though they're a little rebuilding. Redondo Union, I mentioned, is good. San Clemente. Now, San Clemente is an interesting team. They have had some good wins. They beat Modern Day in the Dave Mose tournament. However, I don't know. San Clemente has tall players, but most of them are beach volleyball players. And they're kind of having to adapt to playing indoors, which could take a while. I think they can make a run in Division One, but it's still up in the air. Palos Verdes, like I said, that could be a dark horse team. Another dark horse team is Vista Marietta. Now, this team, this team was not talked about a whole lot. I didn't really talk about this team, and I apologize. But this team made it into the top 16. Unfortunately, they lost in their, their first round game, and they fell 
eventually to Lakewood, and they eventually fell to Archbishop. They eventually fell to Redondo Union as well. So they basically tied for 16th. So they had a great day in day one. They won their pool despite being a two seed. But then day two was kind of brutal for them. They lost in the first round. I want to say they lost to Marymount in three sets, which is a bummer. And then losing to... Lakewood, that's also a bummer because it hurts them in the standings, even though I don't think they were ranked ahead of them. And then losing to Redondo also hurt them as well. So overall, it, it was just a – I wouldn't say it was bad luck on their part, but I just think that it wasn't really – the day, the second day could have gone a whole lot better for them, but I still think they are legit just because they have Claire Little, who is a BYU commit, and I really think – I don't think it's just her by herself. Vista Marietta has other players stepping up, which I have to really get back on seeing how good Vista Marietta is doing. I'm pretty sure they're going to run through their league with the exception of maybe losing one, but that league is theirs to lose, and I'm sure they're going to be in the Division One bracket this season, this upcoming playoffs. And then that's pretty much the entire – that's pretty much all the teams that I think can contend in Division One. I. I think Harvard Westlake's a borderline team, but if they pull an upset or two in their league or they win a tournament that could be forthcoming, I think they could possibly make noise in the Division One bracket. And then I think that's kind of where it stops from there. Elise and Aguil is kind of – they're too – they're too inconsistent when it comes to – making it into the Division One bracket. Beckman is deaf. They have no competition in their bracket. This is courtesy of the CIF Southern Section Division One and Two coaches poll. Beckman, I don't think... They're good, but their league does not do them any favors because they're probably the best team in that league, hands down. And then Cypress, J. Sarah, San Juan Hills, those, those are not true contender teams. In Division 2, they could contend, but I'll talk about the whole CIF Southern Section division placement later on the season. But that's going to do it for some high school girls volleyball. We're going to take ourselves a quick little commercial break. When we come back, we've got some NCAA volleyball to discuss. Lots of history being, well, some bit of history being made. Some stat stuffers, my team of the week. And we also have to recap some week three act, week four action as we get into week number five. So keep it locked here. You are listening to Set Point here on IA Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago. And you need to check out Shy Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, White Sox. We'll cover them all plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing. And we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Shy Town Weekly. Every week, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
Hey, sports fans. Do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh, yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all, and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. What is going on, everybody? My name is Harrison Glazer, and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast. I cover the Jets, the Islanders, the Nets, and the Yankees. This is Fia Moss, and I cover the Mets, Knicks, Rangers, and the Giants. Our show is live every Wednesday through Spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content. Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in. Again, that's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Back with segment number two of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely check out all of our shows, such as Chi Town Weekly, which goes on an hour before this sh- show goes on. Then let's whine about DMV Sports with Mike Pat. Chi Town Weekly is done by Adam Clark. He talks about all things Chicago sports. Let's whine about DMV Sports is done by Mike Pat. He talks all things DMV Sports while enjoying a glass of wine. And the show that never sleeps with. Pierre Moss and Harrison Glazer is also on Wednesdays. You can definitely check out those shows and all of our amazing shows on IE Sports Radio. Let's get on into segment number two. We'll try to go through this as fast as possible just because I don't want another near two-hour show. So we'll start off with the NCAA Women's Volleyball Week 4 upset. So we had a lot of upsets yet again. As We'll start on Tuesday We'll start off with Stanford versus Nebraska at Nebraska. So this matchup, Stanford upset Nebraska in four sets. Stanford was number nine at the time. Some people were saying Stanford was going to get swept. Some people were saying that Nebraska was going to win this one. They were still going to win this one regardless. But I had this little inkling that Stanford was going to win. I didn't call it, but I was like, I have this strange feeling Stanford might actually win. And they did. What really set the tone was taking the first set, 27-25. I feel if Stanford doesn't take that set, Nebraska feels good on its home floor going into set number two. Eventually, Stanford took that, 25-22. Nebraska woke up, won the third set, 25-19. And then Stanford, despite having to face a set point opportunity from Nebraska, won it, 27-25. They actually led throughout most of that set, and then Nebraska made one last push. But then Stanford shut the door on them. Stanford was led by Kendall Kipp, who had 15 kills, while this girl, Elia Rubin, she also had 13 kills. I expect her to be Pac-12 Freshman of the Year. Barring anything drastic happening, Elia Rubin's going to be Pac-12 Freshman of the Year. And if she plays her cards right, she could be the National Freshman of the Year. Because remember, she comes from that Marymount team that went 35-0, and won the National Championship, won every tournament, championship, you name it. So, Elia Rubin is going to be a problem for opposing teams once she gets out of her freshman year. And then Katie Baird added 10 kills as Stanford hit 211 on the night. They did 
they got out dug and they barely got out blocked, but they did mostly everything like right, right. And they missed a lot of serves. They missed twenty three serves, which is oof. Oh dear. They did help hold Nebraska to 166 on the night in terms of hitting percentage as Maddie Kubik led the way with 13 kills. Whitney Lornstein, she has been big time. She is only a sophomore. Remember that name. She is going to be the next big hitter for Nebraska. She had 11 kills. Lindsey Krause had 9 kills. They did. They outdug Stanford barely, 68-64, to 64, as Elana Ogilvie had 21 digs, and Cami Miner had 14 digs to go along with her 41 assists. And then Nebraska had 68 digs on the night. Maddie Kubik led that department with 15. Lexi Rodriguez added 13. And then Annie Evans chipped in 12 digs as well. In terms of blocks, Nebraska barely outblocked Stanford 10 to half to 10, which is impressive. They missed fewer serves, but again, the hitting percentage was not their night. They even hit negative two. They hit negative twenty-five in set number two. It's like yikes. That's not really Nebraska at all. But Stanford is a very good team. Stanford is the real deal, and they didn't have the most dynamic night, but they had a night worth remembering against the against Nebraska. Jumping over to Thursday, we had Pepperdine playing Minnesota in the Diet Coke Classic. Now, this matchup, oh boy, I did not know about this history. So, Pepperdine and Minnesota only met for the fourth time in its team history. The two have been playing since, like, the early 90s, if not the 80s. Minnesota has won all three meetings. Two of those meetings went actually five sets. But here's the thing about Minnesota. They have they had won... 22 matches in a row in the Diet Coke Classic. That was until Pepperdine upset them, as they won in four sets. Minnesota won the first set, 28-26, and I was very surprised that that Pepperdine dropped that set. And it's like, oh, this is going to be a complete avalanche for Pepperdine. But then Pepperdine responded by taking the second set, 25-20, 25-20, and then the third set, they just led the entire way, never trailed, never tied, won that set 25-18, and then the fourth set, they jumped out to an early lead, and they wound up winning 25-22. Quite the impressive victory for the Waves. First win over Minnesota in its team's history, and once again, it was the first loss in the Diet Coke Classic for Minnesota in over 10 years. That's how long it's been since Minnesota has lost a match in the Diet Coke Classic. So big, big, big tip of the cap to Pepperdine as they were led by freshman Emily Helmuth, who had 21 kills. She hit 516. More about her a little bit later. Rachel Ahrens, Meg Brown, and Grace Chillingworth each had 11 kills. Chillingworth had the best hitting percentage of the trio with a hitting percentage of 333. Riley Patterson has adapted well at the libero position. She had 21 digs, while Aarons and Kaylee Hames each chipped in 10 digs. Pepperdine, as a team, outdug Minnesota 61 to 55, and they also outblocked Minnesota by two, 10 to eight. They also dub- doubled them up in terms of service aces, which is quite nice. And I really thought Pepperdine did a great job when you're able to out defense a really good defensive team like Minnesota, you're doing things correct in the NCAA volleyball world. Pepperdine did hit 279. Their hitting percentage got so much better with the exception of set four. It got better as the match progressed as they hit 186 in the first set, but bumped that up to 258, went up to 375, which was mind blowing. And then they hit 300 in set four. As for Minnesota, they hit 204 on the night. They were led by Taylor Lanfair, who had 16 kills. McKenna Wurcher had 13 kills. CeCe McGraw chipped in 19 digs, while Mulaney Shaftmaster and Lanfair both had 10 digs. Overall for Minnesota, I don't know why they weren't able to win. Don't get me wrong, Pepperdine is a great team, and they have had some big wins. And they also kind of kept up with Nebraska, but I was very surprised that they lost this one 
at home to that to a non power five conference team. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for non power five conference teams winning. But I was just very surprised to see Minnesota losing this matchup. Their only losses were to Texas and and Stanford, which are both very good teams. While Pepperdine's losses were to Northwestern, which I was very surprised they lost that one, and then they lost to Nebraska. You also got to remember that Pepperdine did beat Washington, and they also beat, whatchamacallit, Washington and Baylor. They beat, Pep- they beat Baylor at Pepperdine, and then they beat Washington at Washington. So add this to the other list of upsets for Pepperdine this year. Now, how about this one? Jumping over to Friday's matchup, we had Georgia Tech ticket on Arkansas at Arkansas in the Barnhill Arena. On paper, I felt this was going to be a sneaky good matchup just because Georgia Tech does have a lot of good hitters, but so does Arkansas. The first set, Arkansas really set the tone. They only tied once. They led all the way as they dominated the first set 25-16. I was very surprised. I'm like, Whoa, that's that's rather surprising to see Georgia Tech getting being on the wrong side of that lopsided set. I know they had one, I think, against Illinois, but for them to be on the wrong side of this set, it makes me wonder, Arkansas is the real deal, or Georgia Tech just was not ready for that? I think Arkansas is the real deal. Second set, Georgia Tech kind of got together, narrowly won the second set 25-23. Third set, Arkansas was able to wiggle their way into winning that third set, 25-22. And then the fourth set, Arkansas got off to an early lead. They were able to hold back Georgia Tech as they won at 25-20, as they pulled off the upset against Georgia Tech. I said that on Twitter that Arkansas defeated Georgia Tech at Georgia Tech. Uh, I kind of, that was a little bit of a mistake on my part. They actually won at, they actually beat Georgia Tech at Arkansas. So, my bad everyone, I'm sorry, I'm human. Leading Arkansas in the win was Jillian Gillen, who had 18 kills. Taylor Head had 14 kills. Haley DeRegal had 12 kills. And Maggie Cartwright added 9 kills. Honestly, this is the offense that I knew Arkansas was going to have. And Arkansas is really proving themselves. Last week, they were in the top 25. They nearly squeaked into the top 25. And now they really deserve to be in the top 25. They really impressed me. And they followed that up with a four-set win over NC State. Overall, it was just a great night for Arkansas. They did get out by four, but that's all good. And blocks were practically even, 4-4. Four, four. As a team, though, Arkansas hit two, or yeah, they hit three twelve while holding Georgia Tech to two thirteen. As leading Georgia Tech in the win, or Georgia Tech in the loss, was Julia Bergman, who had twenty two kills. Breland Morissette added ten kills, and Bianca Bertolino added nine kills. So, and then Aaron Moss also chipped in seven kills. Got to include that as well. Georgia Tech in the dig department was led by Paola. Pimentel, who had 20 digs, Bertolino had 17 digs, and Bergman added 11 digs. She is a double-double machine. But unfortunately, tonight wasn't really the night, as Georgia Tech only, also only had two service aces compared to Arkansas's seven. And while they did miss seven, four serves fewer, that 213 stat is kind of alarming. I mean, Julia did great. Julia Bergman did great. Morissette also did well as well, and... Bertolino was okay, even though she took 40 swings. But overall, this I was a little surprised to see Georgia Tech coming out on the short end of this. I thought they were at least going to push it to five, but it just goes to show how good Arkansas is. I keep trying to tell you all, Arkansas is a good team. Do not sleep on the Razorbacks. This is going to be a fun SEC season when it comes to women's volleyball. Next up on the upset list, this was kind of a small, and I forgot about this little upset, UCF, Central Florida, upsetting number 23, Kansas, then number 23, Kansas. They won in straight sets, 25-22, 28-26, 25-21. Now, I actually was talking with one of the hosts on Twitter as the host of, one of the hosts of Six Rotations, Daniel Gilman. He says, will this finally get UCF into the top 25? I'm willing to own up to this. I said they were barely not going to make it, but you're going to see that I was completely wrong. This win 
truly mattered for them. UCF was led by McKenna Melville, who had 23 kills. More on her later, as she also hit 352. Claudia Dillon added 9 kills, which was nice. And then Kari Zumach had, had 8 kills. Sorry about that. UCF hit 339 as a team, as their best hitting percentage came in... In set number one, where they only had three hitting errors. They also had only two hitting errors in set four, which was not bad. They g- did get out dug by Kansas 51-47, to but they out-blocked the opposing team by one. They had 16 block assists. While it does look like a lot, as a team, it totals out to only eight. Can- oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing my math wrong. <laughs> it was not eight to seven. It was eight to four. So... That's basically doubling Kansas's blocks as a whole. Kansas as a team hit 256, which wasn't bad. They were led by Aya Ayanadi, who had 12 kills. Caroline Bien had 10 kills. This is kind of where they miss Caroline Crawford from last year, but now she is on Wisconsin, and unfortunately, that's just how it is. Kennedy Ferris had 17 digs for Kansas, while Bien had 11 digs. And then leading the offense was Cameron Turner, who had 30 assists. So overall, it was just a game to forget for Kansas, and that might might up that 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 might wind up costing them in terms of possible NCAA seeding. Uh, Kansas is still having a good season. It's just that this loss kind of derailed them. Now, jumping over to another Friday matchup we had, we had Wisconsin versus Florida. So this matchup was a doozy of a matchup. This was number four Wisconsin taking on, I think it was 14, number 14 Florida. Either way, Florida upset Wisconsin. This was played at the Kohl Center just because I think Wisconsin thought that this matchup was not going to be big enough for both fan bases as Long story short, Florida won the first two sets in quite surprising fashion. 25-21, 25-18. I was like, wait, what is happening? And they were actually leading in set number three. And I'm like, whoa. Are they really going to sweep Wisconsin at the Kohl Center? After all that hype and after all that hoopla of Wisconsin just trying to get back on track, facing Florida just to have them getting swept in front of In front of a major crowd, just for that? No. Wisconsin won the third set, 28-26. They steamrolled their way through set four, 25-13. And then Florida narrowly escaped. They won that fifth set, 15-13. They won off a block at the net, which is probably no better feeling. And that was how Florida basically upset Wisconsin. And it was quite the win. Florida was led by Merritt Beeson, who had 21 kills. Last I checked, she was one of their younger players. I want to say she was either a sophomore or a freshman. Either way, she was big time for Florida. Gabby Essex had 10 kills. Marina Markova chipped in 8 kills. Good to see that she wasn't just taking all the swings. As a team, Florida hit 115. Oof. And funny enough, Wisconsin also hit only 115. Yikes. But the blocks were very high, as Wisconsin had 20 blocks compared to 16 for Florida. But the digs were also high, as Florida outdug Wisconsin 56-52. to In terms of the serve battle, that was won by Florida in terms of aces, while Wisconsin had fewer service errors. Wisconsin was led by Danielle Hart and Sarah Franklin, who each had 10 kills. Now, this is kind of surprising, only seeing 10 kills. So, it's, yeah. It's a little weird seeing Wisconsin only having their kill leader have 10 kills. As we welcome Mike Patton to the live chat room. Thank you for joining me, Mike. Julia Orzel added 8 kills, while Devin Robinson added 7 kills. So, overall... This was just an interesting yet bad night for Wisconsin. Credit to Florida State. Florida, though. Credit to Florida. They really came out, and they were so close to being my team of the week. More on that later. Jumping over to Sunday, we had Creighton taking on Rice. This was actually played at Rice as I've been hyping up Rice for so long. I really think Rice has been such a great team. They only had one loss going into this, a five-set loss to Oregon. I keep telling y'all to buy your stock onto the Rice Owls. 
They eventually pulled off the upset against Creighton. Won the first set 25-22. They actually could have taken the second set. I want to say they were up 22 to like 18. And then Creighton went on. I think it was like 21 to 17. Either way, Creighton closed out on a big run to win it 25-22. Rice won the or Creighton won the third set 25-22. And then Rice won the fourth set 25-21. And then it took Rice a couple match points, but they were able to win the fifth set 16 to 14 as they pulled off their biggest win of the season. And my goodness, Rice, they've come they grow up so fast. Rice was led by Anoda Ad, oh my goodness. Anoda Ada Kunele, who had 23 kills. Sahara Maruska had 13 kills. Eli Baishelmeyer had 12 kills. And Danielle Courtley had 10 kills. My goodness. Both these teams combined for 215 kills, or 215 digs, as Rice had 107 digs compared to Creighton's 108. The big thing that did stand out to me was the blocks. Rice outblocked Creighton 12 to 4. Creighton is not going to win that matchup if they're getting outblocked by three times their amount. As a team, Rice hit 252 despite all the digs and the blocks that happened. Creighton, on the other hand, hit 196 as they were led by Jazz Schmidt, who had 17 kills, while Kiara Reinhardt added 15 kills. Healy Davis added 13 kills. Kiana Schmidt had it, added 12 kills. And Nora Sis, ugh, she had probably one of her forgettable games. 11 kills, but she had 10 hitting errors. But it's understandable probably because A, some of her kills got kill attempts got dug up. B, her she got blocked at the net because, remember, Rice had 12 blocks. And then C... It mu- I think she was just trying to carry the team too much. She has a high standard for how she plays, which is totally understandable. I like her pride in the game of volleyball. Overall, it was just a great matchup, and I'm very happy for Creighton, or not Creighton, for Rice, just because they earned this win. They knew they needed a big breakout win, and they got it. Now I really wonder what they're going to do in in a conference play, in Conference USA play. Speaking of Conference USA, I actually didn't get a chance to print out this little matchup or this upset, but Texas A&M upset number 21 Western Kentucky in straight sets. Now, that's a little surprising, but at the same time, Texas A&M, the team that I ripped, well, I don't know, back in the COVID year, they're actually doing really well, and more on them a little bit later. Last upset we had was number 12... Pitt taking on Ohio State, number five Ohio State. And Pitt swept away Ohio State, which was quite nice. I really thought this was a big win for Pitt just because they needed a a win after losing to Towson. They also swept Tennessee, but Tennessee has kind of been a little bit of a mess. As Pitt won the first set 25-21, they never trailed in that set, so that's something to note. Second set, despite trailing twice... They actually won the second set 25-15 by a huge margin. And then the third set, Pitt turned the tables on Ohio State. They actually trailed for a good chunk of the set, but they took charge as the set went on and eventually won it 25-22. Pitt was led by Courtney Bazzario, Pitt's Athlete of the Week for the second straight week, as she had 15 kills, only one hitting error for a hitting percentage of 412. Valeria Vasquez-Gomez added 10 kills. As a team, Pitt hit 296. And as for Ohio State, they only hit 145, as leading them was Emily Landot, who had 16 kills. The next kill leader was way too far, as Janasia Moore and Gabby Gonzalez each had 6 kills. It's like, yikes! As we welcome Kayla Henderson in the chat room. Good to see you, buddy. Just recapping some NCAA women's volleyball action. Ohio State, this was not their game, as Londot basically kind of had to carry the team. She had 12 digs in addition to having their 16 kills, and then Kylie Murr had 10 digs. It was just a not so good night for, or not so good day for Ohio State, as Pitt really literally swept them. But this isn't surprising. 
Playing at Pitt is no joke. Pitt is a very good team on their home floor, even though Towson kind of proved that wrong. So overall, it's not a bad loss for Ohio State, but it, I think it's kind of their wake-up call. But this is what happens when you schedule really tough. You're going to get everyone's tough A game. That's that for all of the Wisconsin – or not Wisconsin. the All of the matchups that happened, the, all the upsets that happened in week number four. Kale says go Big Red. Yeah, about Nebraska – well, they kind of lost to Stanford on t- last Tuesday, but they rebounded nicely against Kentucky. That that's what truly matters, Kale. So, but he says go big red. Now that he mentions Nebraska, let's go to the AVCA Division 1 Women's Volleyball Coaches Poll. 25 through 21 consists of UCF at 25, Western Kentucky at 24, Rice at 23, Creighton at 22, and Oregon at 21. 20 through 16 consists of Arkansas at 20, Marquette at 19, Washington at 18, Pepperdine at 17, and BYU at 16. 15 through 11 consists of Kentucky at 15, Baylor at 14, Georgia Tech at 13, Florida at 12, and Purdue at 11. 10 through 6 consists of Pitt at 10, Penn State at 9, Minnesota at 8, Ohio State at 7, and Wisconsin at 6. 5 through 1 consists of Stanford at 5, San Diego, or USD, at 4, Nebraska at 3, Louisville at 2, and your number one team and still number one team in the ABCA Division I coaches poll for this week is Texas. So quite a bit of movement happening as Penn State is back in the top 10, which is kind of where they where they naturally belong as a perennial program, but it's just so interesting to see them in the top 10. They have, they are currently undefeated, which is it, very amazing. If you had told me Penn State was going to be undefeated going into conference play, I might have looked at you a little bit oddly, but you got to give them credit. Penn State is the real deal. Just because they have Katie Schumacher Colley as their new head coach following Russ Rose does not mean they're a bad program. They just need time to like figure out their young players. And Nebraska unfortunately did take a loss, but they only went down one spot. I really think that that loss might have been the best thing for them just because now they don't have the pressure of staying undefeated because everyone was saying that the only team that could beat Nebraska is Nebraska themselves or Texas. Now the question remains... Who is the only team that – who is the team that could beat Texas going forward? I think the team – anybody could beat Texas. Well, not anybody, but I don't think Texas is indestructible. But you also have to remember that Texas kind of wilts when it comes to NCAA tournament time. As Kale mentions in the chat room, Nebraska volleyball is a powerhouse indeed. And he – I should also make note that Nebraska did upset the number two seed Texas in the NCAA tournament. So don't count out Nebraska – let alone after this one loss. And don't think that Texas is going to win the whole thing. Yes, they are stacked all across the board, but this week, Texas, or last week, Texas lost a set to Houston of all teams. University of Houston. The Cougars. So it's quite interesting to see what will happen to Texas going forward. I'm pretty sure they're going to run through the Big 12 like it's nobody's business. I don't think there's a whole lot of teams that could hang with Texas. Let, let alone in the Big 12. It's their conference to lose. And then UCF. Now this team, I totally forgot that this team was undefeated. The win over Kansas did get them into the top 25 as they just barely wiggled on in. I knew they were, they were receiving votes, but I didn't think they would get into the top 25. But I will own up to that and I will say, my bad, every, my bad UCF fans, I'm, I'm, I apologize. But UCF is a legit team. But we can't crown him just yet. And then Rice, I am very, I am over the moon about Rice being ranked just because they were a part of my teams that you should buy stock into that are unranked and that are not Power 5 Conference. Rice definitely proved themselves not only against Creighton, but they beat Kansas State. They're actually down 0-2, so they had to reverse sweep their way to winning the match, and they did so. So, I am quite impressed, and Kansas State is not a bad team at all. Kansas State is a legit team. I really thought Kansas State was going to also be a sneaky good matchup against Rice, and I give them credit. They were able to push Rice to the brink on the road, 
But for Rice, I really give them credit on rallying down from 0-2 to winning in 5. And then Rice beating Creighton is no joke as well, especially when the Creighton's offense is that much balanced. So for so for Rice, I'm not surprised to see them in the top 25. I knew they would get in, especially beating the then number 17, number 17 team. And then Arkansas went up. Pepperdine had the biggest jump up as they went up five spots. Arkansas went up four spots. Stanford went up five spots. I was also surprised to see San Diego going up to number four, but San Diego is is doing great. Again, I still own up to me saying that San Diego was still a prove me prove that you belong in the top twenty five team, and I admit I will own up to San Diego not being as good as I initially thought. But remember, they have so many good transfers. They have Gabby Blossom, who came from from Penn State. Brianna Edwards, who came from Indiana. They also got another transfer from Indiana. Really good transfer. And they also had Katie Lukes coming back for her fifth, for her fifth year, courtesy of the COVID year. Grace Froelig was also a, is also a good piece for them. And then... I forget the libero's name, but she's also good as well. Either way, San Diego, I am, I've seen the light. San Diego does have a good team. So that is that for breaking down the top 25. Basically, Texas is kind of your only undefeated team outside of Penn State, UCF. And then there's also Towson, who is on the outside looking in. They're basically trying to get votes in. They, they are definitely receiving votes. More on them later, though. So let's go on to our stat stuffers from last week. So our stat stuffers from last week consist of McKenna Melville of UCF. So I talked a little about McKenna Melville as she led the way in Kansas's win, but she also had another milestone that she eclipsed as she is now the all-time kill leader at UCF as she has 2,152 kills and counting for the Golden Knights or for the Knights. Either way, She's the all-time leader at UCF. And she's only the, she's the only active player with 2,000 or more kills currently right now. So congratulations to McKenna Melville. She's our first stat stuffer of the week. And I, I'm expecting big things from UCF. Now that they're ranked, there's now a target on their back. And especially with another team that could probably surprise them in conference play. But more on that later. Our second stat stuffer is Alexa Rousseau. If I mispronounced her name, I apologize. But Alexa Rousseau posted her first triple-double of the season, totaling 11 kills, 11 digs, and 44 assists in Northwestern's four-set win over DePaul. It's actually the second triple-double of her NCAA volleyball career, as she had one back last season against Northern Colorado. That's our second stat stuffer of last week. Then we go to Taylor Hefo of UC Riverside. Yes, UC Riverside. She totaled a triple-double for the Highlanders, totaling 10 kills, 17 digs, and 51 assists, 51 assists in the Highlanders' five-set loss to Idaho State. Hefo's triple-double is actually the first triple-double marked from the Big West since 2018. My guess is, is that the older Eosia, Nalani Eosia's, Noreen Eosia, that's her name. Noreen Eosia had the previous triple double back in 2018, but that's just my guess. But for Taylor Hefo making that little milestone, I didn't even know that was the first triple double since 2018 from the Big West Conference. But when you talk about all these great teams in the Big West Conference, you talk about the Hawaii's, the Long Beach States, the Cal Polys, the UC Santa Barbara's, even though the latter two are kind of not having the best season so far. But you talk about all those teams. This girl from UC Riverside had herself a big matchup, and despite the loss, she was able to post those stats and make history, not only for UC Riverside, but for the Big West Conference. So hats off to Taylor Hefo on being the stat stuffer, another stat stuffer. And then we jump on over to Ella May Powell. So she made history as she is now second all-time in assists at Washington as she is right behind Courtney Thompson. Thompson is the all-time assist leader at Washington with 6,552. Ella May Powell has 
5,371 assists, so she has a way to go in order to become the all-time leader. But if Washington does have a deep NCAA tournament run, and if her assists become as high as can be, then heaven knows she could possibly break it. So that's that for the player statist for the player stat stuffers. Going over to this little stat stuffer. So remember how last week Nebraska at Creighton totaled fifteen thousand seven hundred and ninety-seven fans at the CHI Health Center. Well, remember that little matchup I talked about with Florida playing Wisconsin at the Kohl Center. This was the matchup everyone wanted to flock over to. So this matchup totaled a grand total of 16,833 fans at the Florida at Wisconsin matchup at the Kohl Center. So basically we had another record smashed prior to the one that Nebraska and Creighton wound up putting together. So congratulations to Florida and Wisconsin for making the history. Florida eventually got the last laugh as they wound up winning in five sets in a thriller. So basically these matchups do not disappoint. And then my NCAA Women's Volleyball Team of the Week, jumping over to that, is Pepperdine. I was really torn when it came to picking a Team of the Week for this week. I had so many good candidates. Pitt was one. Georgia Tech was one. Or not not Georgia Tech. Arkansas was one. Pitt, Arkansas were were basically a pair of candidates. Texas A&M was one. Florida was one. Rice was one. UCF was one. The list went on and on. I was going to... This would have made my decision quite easy if Stanford had swept the weekend, but they split the weekend having defeated Nebraska on Tuesday, last Tuesday, and then last Saturday they lost to Louisville in four sets. So Pepperdine was my team of the week as, once again, they were able to top Minnesota for the first time in its team's history, and they also snapped... Minnesota's 22-match winning streak in the Diet Coke Classic, which spanned over 10 years. In addition to winning that, Pepperdine also beat Washington State in five sets. Now, Washington State, they only have a couple losses on the season. They lost to BYU, and then they had this one. Funny enough, they're both from the West Coast Conference. But beating Washington State was no easy feat, especially when they were down 2-1. They dropped a heartbreaker of a third set, 31-29 especially when they rallied back from 24-22. Pepperdine won the third, uh, the fourth set 26-24, and then they just steamrolled their way to winning that fifth set 15-6. And Emily Helmuth had herself a big game in both games. She Obviously, I talked about her in her big game, again, the 21 kills against Minnesota, but she also added 14 kills, which was good for second most in that matchup against Washington State. So overall, Pepperdine is really kicking butt and taking names. They did so against Baylor, they did so against Washington, and they did so against Minnesota. Obviously losing to Northwestern was a tough one, but that was after they beat Washington. And I'll be talking a little about Northwestern in a little, in a little bit. So that is that for all of week four. Jumping on over to the unranked Power 5 conference teams you should buy stock on. So I basically had to do a lot of home improvement and rearranging. I still have Florida State in the top five, or my five teams from a Power 5 conference that are unranked that you should buy stock on. But I have a few more newcomers. So number five, we have Texas A&M. Remember, last weekend they upset slash swept Western Kentucky. But prior to that, they did lose to Indiana, which obviously Big Ten country is not easy to win in, but or win against. But what can you do? Texas A&M's only losses outside of the Indiana loss were, are to San Diego and Pitt, both of which are really good teams. I really think that this team has lots of talent. As Caroline Muth, a tra- the graduate transfer from Notre Dame, has been doing big wonders for the Aggies, while freshman opposite Logan Lednicki has also been doing great things for Texas A&M. This is a team that's going to be really good in the future. They were really good back in 2019, before the pandemic happened, and ever since they've kind of had a little bit of a tough, tough sledding. 
This week they play at Ole Miss and then on Wednesday, and then they return home for a two-game homestand against Tennessee on Saturday and Sunday. This is their chance to actually prove themselves and prove that the Western Kentucky win was no fluke. And also those three matchups that I just mentioned, definitely winnable. Tennessee's still figuring things out, while Ole Miss is also kind of figuring things out as well. So this is their perfect chance to go 3-0 and and get an early jump on the SEC. Number, the next team I have on here is Northwestern. Northwestern is 11-1, and and I wish Adam Karnak was in the chat room, but I digress. Their only loss was to Washington, which was a competitive four-set loss. Remember, they beat Pepperdine last week. They caught the waves off guard, which I think is quite impressive. And last week they went 3-0 and as they, de- they defeated DePaul UIC, or University of Illinois Chicago, and Loyola Chicago in the little... I forget the name of the tournament, but I'm just going to call it the Chicago Classic. Either way, Northwestern went 3-0. and They're 11-1, and which is the best start in their program's history. And everything's looking up for them. Now, this week, it gets a little bit tougher. This week, they are on the road to start Big Ten Conference play against Wisconsin. And they are also at Illinois on Saturday. That's basically back-to-back nights. Wisconsin Friday, Illinois Saturday. The good news is, is that Illinois kind of had a rough weekend as well. I think they lost to Illinois State. Either way, they dropped out of the top 25. And I kind of feel that Northwestern can defeat Illinois. I'm definitely not I'm not certain about Wisconsin. But one player that is definitely worth noting outside of the little setter that I just outside of the setter that I just mentioned, Alexa Rousseau. And this girl, this girl is probably the most legit player I have seen on Northwestern ever since probably Emily Eamon and Peyton Chang. But the player of the week this week is I, I, I'm gonna try to like not pronounce her, mispronounce her name. But the the player of the week this week, the ABCA player of the week is Temi Thomas Ilara, who I think is probably one of the best dynamic players in the Big Ten. And that's not just saying that just to be light. I really think that this girl is the real deal in terms of top, some of the top players in the Big Ten. Do I think Northwestern is a complete powerhouse? No. They're obviously going to run into the thick of their schedule when facing the Nebraskas, the Wisconsins, the Penn States, the Minnesotas. They're, they're now officially into the the deep heart of their schedule. But I could definitely see them getting their first winning season. It would be huge if they got that. And who knows, maybe they can make the NCAA tournament. Next, t- Now, the next unranked Power 5 conference team that you should buy stock on is USC. I'm going to sound a little biased for saying this, but I think USC has a good chance of winning this weekend. They face UCLA in their conference opener. Now, you're probably thinking, well, it's UCLA. They're scary, and they're quite good. Well, that yes and no. No due to the fact that Charity Looper is not playing. She did not play last week, and she did not play the week before. Last week, UCLA got swept by San Diego, and then they swept San Diego State. We don't care about the latter of the two. Here's my thing. USC has some good players, like Skylar Fields, Amelia Vesca, Mia Tuaniga, the list goes on and on. I really think USC can beat UCLA. I know it's going to be at Pauley Pavilion. It's UCLA's first home game, considering their home tournament was actually moved to LMU, but it's the first actual home game for UCLA. Can USC beat UCLA? Absolutely. If... But here's the thing. If Charity Looper does play, because I don't know the whereabouts of her injury or what what her injury is. All I just know is that she did not play. But if Charity Looper does play, then it's going to be a little bit tougher for USC. And if Charity Looper does play on Thursday or whenever the two teams play, then USC has got to be careful. But I still think UCLA is still trying to figure things out following the graduation of... Mac May. So that's kind of a little bit of an advantage for USC. They return a good portion of their team, and then they also have 
a couple good transfers. They have a decent freshman class, so overall, yeah. I really think is I really think that USC has a good chance of starting off one and oh. They also play Washington State on Sunday, but it's like I don't know. Washington State I think is better than most people give them credit for. Next team on my unranked Power 5 conference teams you should, you should buy stock on is Duke. Now, Duke, okay, ever since their little, you know, nationally... Okay, let's start, take it from the top. Duke ended non-conference play 9-2. and two. Everyone did not think that Duke was going to do good things this year. But they've, they're currently on a nine-match winning streak, and their only losses were to Washington State and BYU. More on that later, but... Their standout wins are against Michigan and Michigan State. Both of those teams are actually fairly decent, as as Michigan State, I think, only lost one. That was their only loss in non-conference play. And then Michigan State, obviously, they were doing well starting out, and then they ran to the buzzsaw that was Duke. So we all remember the little national controversy that happened with the whole BYU-Duke thing. That obviously those were their two losses, but ever since that whole thing cleared up, Duke has won nine in a row. Do I think Duke is the powerhouse of the ACC? No, this isn't basketball. This is volleyball we're talking about. I don't think they're going to upend the Pitts or the Georgia Techs or the Louisvilles, but I sure think they definitely have a good shot at making the NCAA tournament. And for them to have I don't think most people predicted them to be fourth in terms of overall record, but they have some good players on their team. Gracie Johnson, I want to say she's in her fifth year because she has that extra year of eligibility due to COVID. She was able to, she's been doing really well offensively for the Blue Devils. Rachel Richardson has also done well. Devin Chang, who transferred from UCLA, has led the offense quite proudly. Lizzie Fleming has also done well. She's third on the team in kills. He's barely under 100 kills this season, but she's eventually going to break down that door. Duke opens up with Syracuse on Friday and Boston College on Saturday. Both are on the road, but I think both those teams are winnable. Boston College may be a little bit tougher just because they had themselves a good little non-conference schedule they managed to do well in. But I really think that Duke has what it takes to take down at least those teams. I don't expect them to take down the big-time teams, at least not yet. But I really think that Duke definitely is a team to watch for in the ACC. No one is sleeping on them. Not even North Carolina. And then my last team that is unranked and from a Power 5 conference that you should buy stock on is Florida State. They disappointed me last year, or last week though. Last week, I was very surprised that they got swept by Florida. Florida is a talented team, and they were playing in Gainesville. But I at least wanted them to take a set off the Gators. Like, what are you doing, Florida State? (laughs) They have good chemistry, but they have to serve and pass well. Otherwise, they're going to be at the mercy of every other team in the ACC. They did get back on track by defeating UAB, but is that really a great match? Uh, Is that really the true best win? No. (laughs) So this week, they are back home playing Notre Dame on Friday, and they are at home against number 2 Louisville on Sunday to open up ACC play. For me, a 1-1 one one record is a guaranteed win. I think that's a guaranteed victory. Well, not a guaranteed win. A win on the week for Florida State. Just because, for me, I really think that Florida State has potential. They're not going to beat Louisville, but I can at least see them being competitive. Now, Notre Dame is definitely easy picking. I I don't want to say easy pickings, but they should win that one. On paper, Florida State should beat Notre Dame. Notre Dame can be off and on sometimes, but when they're off, they're at the mercy of every other team. Even though they do have some good players that are stepping up, like Fiona Schrader. So those are all my teams to watch for that are – or well, not all my teams to watch for. Those are all my top five teams that you should buy stock into that are currently unranked from a Power 5 conference. Now for the non-Power 5 conference unranked teams that you should buy stock on. I had a little bit of time – to a bit of a pickle trying to figure out teams who you should pick in order to buy stock on. So starting 
starting with number five. I, these are in no particular order, by the way. I had South Dakota. Their only loss is to Louisville. Ever since that loss, South Dakota has won 11 matches in a row. Their best win, however, is kind of Missouri. Missouri isn't a bad team. I think they're improving ever since the previous year where they lost a lot of players to graduation and the transfer portal. But it's probably their best win on paper. South Dakota opens up summer, Summit League play with a tough slate as they face Omaha on Thursday and Denver on Saturday. Both those are home games for South Dakota, so that's the good news. But Omaha was the runner-up in the Summit League tournament, and they won the regular season title last season. And Omaha has been known for pulling off upsets against teams that, they should, that they're not favored against. So for me, I think South Dakota definitely is a team you should buy stock on. I don't think they're going to be ranked anytime soon just because no one in their conference is ranked. The only way everyone else, the only way they get ranked is is if everyone else that's ranked from like 20 all the way to 25 loses. But then you also have to contend with the teams that are currently receiving votes as well like Towson. So overall South Dakota is still a team you should buy stock into. While that's not from a Power 5 conference, and that's not ranked. Number four, we have Colorado State. They split their matchups against rival Colorado. They won the first matchup on in their home gym in four sets, but they lost the second one at Colorado in five sets. I still think they, along with UNLV, you listening, Kale, and Boise State are the heavy favorites to win the Mountain West Conference. I'm not going to try to speak it into existence, but... I really think UNLV, Boise State, and Colorado State are the teams to be in that conference. Colorado State does return a good portion of its team. I really think that the Rams do have a lot of upside to their team. I, it's just all about not having a, an off night. I think their non-conference schedule treated them well. The loss to Arkansas sucked, but now we realize Arkansas is a good team. And then Colorado, at least getting one win off of Colorado is a whole lot, just because Colorado did beat, Nev- not Nevada, Illinois, and that win could go a long way, but we'll see. Number three, we have Long Beach State. I know I'm still a homer for putting Long Beach State on this list, but Long Beach, I really am buying into the hype that Long Beach State is producing. They have lots of good talent, such as Morgan Chacon, Callie Schwarzenbach, Victoria, o- Victoria O'Sullivan, I think that's her name. Jalen Jordan got to see some action. And Katie Kennedy is a stud as she's back playing right side. Z- Zayna Meyer has also been a stud at setter as well. And the libero, Dylan De La Cruz, has also been definitely doing big things for the beach. Here's my thing. So they split their matchup against LMU or Loyola Marymount last weekend, which I thought was impressive. They won one at home at at Long Beach State, and then they lost the other one at LMU. I thought two and one and one was a was a victory in my opinion, and I'm happy they went one and one. Now they got to prove themselves in conference play, and I actually was at their press conference today, their weekly opening press conference in terms of the week. And, oh, I, I have this little quote from from head coach Tyler Hildebrand. He says, and I quote, Our goal is to win the Big West. We think we are capable of that. So our mindset is to have a high goal with low expectations, knowing we are going to have to earn it every day. I like that little quote right there. High goal, low expectations. That is their big goal because conference play is what truly matters. And you look at Long Beach State. They have a five-set loss to Oregon. That's still pretty impressive. A three-set loss to Nebraska. Obviously, that's tough, but Nebraska was the number two team in the nation. And then LMU, obviously, their, their win over UCLA was no fluke. As That's still a pretty solid win considering they I, – I know they lost to them on the road – but then they beat him at home. I still think that's still impressive. As long as they weren't getting like decimated or swept, it's still quite it's still a good win. Do I think LMU can go deep? Nah, I that still remains to be seen. But back to Long Beach State. 
Hawaii, I think, can pose a big threat to them. I also feel that UC Santa Barbara is starting to gain steam, although they just beat Georgetown. Like, not really the best win for them. And then, obviously, you have Cal Poly, who finally got on the board in terms of wins. They won three in a row, as they actually swept all their matches on on the weekend last weekend. So for me, Long Beach state is going to have to prove it. They have three road tests starting with two this weekend. They play at Cal Poly Friday and then they play at Bakersfield, Cal state Bakersfield on Saturday. And then next week they have Cal state Fullerton. They're at Cal state Fullerton. And then they are back at home against Hawaii, which is their true big test. If Long Beach State can go 3-0 and by the time they face Hawaii, they're in good shape going into – going forward. Number two, we've got Houston. Houston is one of only two non-power conf- – yeah. Houston is only one of two non-power five conference teams to receive votes. They took a set off of number one Texas last weekend, and their only losses are to Texas and Rice. Two very good teams. Although they did have a little bit of a hiccup, which saw one of their players get kicked off the team, they're still in good shape. Their best win is against Mississippi State, which was via a reverse sweep, which, if you if you all know, Mississippi State is no longer in my top five Power 5 conference teams that are unranked that you should buy stock on. But as for Houston, I think they pose a big threat to Central Florida, or UCF. The... American Athletic Conference is going to be interesting, and they also could pose a threat to Cincinnati. Cincinnati, I think, is also a sneaky good team from that conference, but Houston, to me, I think they're going to be quite legit. And then my number one team of the unranked non-Power 5 conference teams that you should buy stock into is Towson. They're still undefeated. They swept. They beat Hampton both times in their... Colonial Athletic Association conference opener last weekend. And they're the second of two non-Power 5 conference teams to receive votes. And they're only one of three teams from their conference to have an overall record of 500 or better. They play Stony Brook this week as Stony Brook is winless in conference play. I still think Taos, I feel Towson's going to run through that conference. How deep can they go is dependent on how, you know, how healthy they stay and if they're able to, like, win their tournament. I'm pretty sure they have a conference tournament, but I'm not quite fully sure on that. But either way, they're still my top team you should buy stock into. Now let's get on into the Week 5 matchups to watch for. As we're already an hour and 42 going on 43 minutes into this thing, I'm going to try to speed this up as fast as I can just so I... just to avoid another long episode. So the sneaky good matchups to watch for, starting on Thursday, we have LMU at number 16, BYU. It's time for LMU to prove that their win over UCLA was indeed the real deal. And it's also time for BYU to actually prove that they are indeed a top 25 team. Because now, I was thinking that BYU was going to be the team to beat in the West Coast Conference. Now it is clearly... San Diego, and could BYU be the third best team in the West Coast Conference? Now we're starting to see lots of clouds ahead of BYU after they had so much promise. I don't know. We'll see if BYU... I imagine BYU will win this one just because it's at home, but don't be surprised if LMU manages to pull off an upset, but it's at BYU. I don't think LMU can win this one. We'll see. Then on Friday, in terms of the sneaky good matchups, we have North Carolina at Pitt, number 10 Pitt, that is. North Carolina has put together a decent 8-3 and three record. Here's the thing. They don't really have the big standout victories like Pitt does, though. Pitt has some pretty darn good victories, like against Ohio State. Although the loss to Towson and San Diego weren't really all that great, they've kind of rebounded from those as well. And I really think, and they even have a win over number then number seven BYU. I really think Pitt is still one of the teams to beat in the ACC. I feel UNC or North Carolina can definitely make this an interesting matchup, but I just imagine that Pitt's going to come out on top. But don't sleep on 
the Tar Heels. Especially in the Tobacco State. Jumping to Saturday, we have LMU at number 4 San Diego. It's another prove-yourself matchup against LMU as, boy howdy, LMU has the toughest gauntlet to start in the West Coast Conference. They have, they're at BYU, and then they're back home against San Diego. That's brutal right there. The good news is they're back in California. The bad news is they're facing San Diego. The better news is they LMU is known for beating teams that they're not supposed to beat. Kind of like, I want, I don't remember, I think it was like the COVID year or the post-COVID year where LMU upset San Diego, which really had me baffled and confused. So for San Diego, they just have to take care of business. They have a good team, but LMU is no joke. I think they are kind of for real. The next sneaky good matchup we have is Omaha at South Dakota. This is on Saturday. Like I mentioned about South Dakota, this is basically the the battle of the Summit League finals from last year. And I think that oh, I think Omaha can give South Dakota a run for their money. I would not be surprised if Omaha won, but I feel South Dakota just has a slight edge over Omaha. And then lastly for the sneaky good matchups, number 18 Washington at UCLA. This is this is actually on Sunday. So the Huskies, time for them to prove that they are still one of the favorites to win the Pac-12. They face a UCLA team that's still trying to figure things out. Jumping over to the notable matchups, we have Washington State at Washington. This will be on Wednesday. It's the Apple Cup rivalry as Washington State now has the chance to prove themselves as they des- they're trying to prove that they deserve to be ranked. And then also another notable matchup on Friday, we have Northwestern at – well, actually on Thursday, we have USC at UCLA. This is basically going to be the answer of who deserves to be – a possible at-large Pac-12 team for the NCAA tournament. USC or UCLA? Granted, it's still early, but UCLA is going to really have to figure things out. Either Charity Looper is going to need to come back sooner rather than later, or US or USC is going to run circles around them. I think that UCLA has other good players like Francesca Alupe and Iman Njai, but I think USC is going to come in with high confidence. Now we'll jump on over to Friday's matchup between Northwestern at number six, Wisconsin. On paper, this looks like a mismatch, but Wisconsin should not underestimate Northwestern, especially after how they lost to Florida. If Northwestern wants to really be the Cinderella of the story and of the Big Ten, this is their chance to basically take down the big boss of the Big Ten. Staying with the... Big 10 and jumping over to Saturday, we have Michigan at number nine, Penn state. Michigan has been under the radar as they have been continuing to receive votes in the ABCA coaches poll. Penn state has risen all the way up to number nine after being in like the low, the high twenties. They are now, or the low twenties in this case, I think they were like number 20 to start out. And now they've risen up to number nine. Penn state is undefeated, but now they face a talented Michigan team. I think Michigan can give, Penn State a run for their money, but I think Penn State's going to come out on top. And then Sunday, we have number two Louisville at Florida State. This is Florida State's chance to prove that they can at least hang with Louisville. For Louisville, this is kind of, I feel it with the exception of Georgia Tech and Pitt, this is kind of another speed bump on their way to winning the conference. I think Florida State is good, but I don't think they're on the level of of Louisville, just because clear. Chowse has been outstanding, and Louisville had themselves a big weekend last week as they took down Kentucky in five, and they also took down the other team, Stanford, in four on Saturday. I should also mention that – oh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Oh, that will be a little bit later on in the show. That's all for the notable matchups. Now for the definitely worth noting matchups, number 17, Pepperdine at number six. At number four, San Diego. This will be a Friday matchup. I'm very excited for this matchup. I think that this is Pepperdine's chance to prove, really prove themselves. This is also San Diego's chance to prove that they are the heavy favorite to win the West Coast Conference. I really think that they do have the potential to, but 
Pepperdine has been playing great as of late. Baylor wins over Baylor, Washington, and now Minnesota are no joke. So San Diego has to be careful, but I really am excited to see this matchup. Another matchup to watch for, number 8 Minnesota at number 11 Purdue. This is also on Friday. So Purdue has actually exceeded everyone's expectations. Everyone thought they were going to be rebuilding, but now they are on the verge of looking really, really good. And they could be a dark horse to winning the Big Ten. To do so, they're going to have to take down a talented Minnesota team on its home floor. We'll see what happens with this matchup. And then for my match of the week, and this is a matchup on Saturday, we have number seven, Ohio State, at number three, Nebraska. Oh, boy. Ohio State now has a chance to prove themselves that the loss to Pitt was nothing more than Pitt just being really talented and them struggling on the road. In order to do so, they're going to have to win on the road in Lincoln, Nebraska, against the Huskers. Winning at Nebraska is tough, with the exception of Stanford. So for this matchup, Ohio State's going to have to play really good, and they're going to have to be dialed in. That's because Nebraska has some really talented players, and not just on, on in the upperclassmen, but in terms of the lowerclassmen as well. Also on Saturday, we have number 17, Pepperdine, at number 16, BYU. This is going to be another big-time matchup right here just because West Coast Conference and... We're going to see if Pepperdine can really hold their own against BYU. If BYU wins this one, then this will silence every critic about them. And then on Sunday, we have number 5, Stanford, at number 21, Oregon. This is another big-time matchup, and this is Oregon's chance to really prove to me that they deserve to be in the top 25. I think they deserve to be in the top 25. However, they've had to go the distance with some teams. (coughs) Long Beach State. (coughs) Rice. So... I think Oregon does have what it takes to win this matchup, but they're playing a talented Stanford team. This is a Stanford team coming off of a tough four-set loss, so I imagine Stanford is going to be PO'd. And I'm pretty sure they're going to roll past Cal in their Pac-12 opener. And then lastly, on Sunday, we have number six, Wisconsin, taking on number eight, Minnesota. This was my second match of the week right here, but I kind of had to defer to Nebraska at Ohio State. I really am excited for for this little matchup right here. Wisconsin has to prove themselves that last Friday was nothing more than a little bit of a slip-up. Same with Minnesota. Minnesota also slipped up against a very talented Pepperdine team. I really did not... I, once again, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how they lost. It's quite mind-blowing, if you ask me. But again, Pepperdine is good. So is Florida. Those were the reason those two are the reasons why they were close to my team of the week, though Pepperdine won that honor. So Wisconsin and Minnesota are in the battle of who is better than the other early on in Big Ten conference play. The same could be said for Ohio State and Nebraska, just because those two are also challenge challengers to make a deep NCAA tournament run as well. So that is that for all my matchups to watch for this week. Before we get on out of here, I have to give you all this little tidbit. So remember when I was talking about Louisville's matchup against Kentucky last week? So this matchup right here, Louisville versus Kentucky on ESPN. Yes, ESPN. Not ESPN2, not ESPNU, not ESPN3, not ESPN+. ESPN, the mothership. Basically, that totaled 302,000 viewers. Just for this little Louisville versus Kentucky matchup. Impressive, incredible, absolutely amazing. And it was the most viewed regular season volleyball match ever on ESPN. I should also make a note of of matchups definitely worth noting. Number one, Texas at Kansas. Now you're probably wondering, why did you make note of that, Taryn? That's going to be on ESPN2. That got flexed to ESPN2. I think it was going to be on like... ESPN Plus or something, but they bumped it up to ESPN2. That's going to be on Wednesday. And let's try to get more viewers on that as well. Let's grow the sport of volleyball. But on that note, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Set Point. Once again, I almost went past two hours, or I almost went two hours, but what can you do? Without any further delay, let's drop the beat, because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to Set Point. 
I appreciate everyone that tuned in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I appreciate you. And once again, I apologize if I went nearly two hours for the third straight week. I'm going to hope, hope to try to trim down some fat to make sure I do not get close to two hours. But we don't want a two-hour show. But anyway, thank you to those that tuned in live, Michael Pass, as well as Kale Henderson. I appreciate you two tuning in. Next week, Set Point will not be on Monday. It'll be on Friday because this next Friday is going to be my three-year anniversary of Set Point. I am hoping, hoping I don't go past two hours or anywhere near that. But until then, you all have yourself a great rest of the week. Take care. Don't do anything dumb. I will see you all fr- on Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. But I expect you all to come back next Friday for the three-year anniversary of Step 4. Until then, have a great week. Enjoy the volleyball action across the globe. And I will see you Friday for SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Peace!